manager of the Black Mountain Public Library. I want to say a very special thank you to Jack Aulis. Jack Aulis is donating this beautiful, beautiful photograph that he took of the moon. <laughs> now, it's my pleasure to introduce Rock Ward, lifelong amateur astronomer who's been interested in the space program since its earliest days. We thank you graciously for being with us today. Rock Ward. Here in the Swannanoa Valley, we are privileged and honored to have among us several people who are a vital part of the NASA space program. And you folks may know some of these people. Chuck Hollinshead, who lives at the North Carolina State Veterans Home in Black Mountain, was manager of the news center at NASA for Apollo 11, and served as the voice of launch control for several Apollo missions. Then Colonel John Casper of Montreal was a NASA astronaut. He was the pilot on one space shuttle mission, and he was spacecraft commander on three more. He spent 34 days in space. I wish he could be with us, but he's celebrating elsewhere today. And then Dawson Hunter, a Black Mountain resident, and our guest of honor today was an engineer for Grumman NASA who built the lunar module. That's what made it possible for the astronauts to land on the moon. And over the past several months, Dawson has graciously and expertly constructed these scenes, these panels, to show us what Apollo 11 was all about, how it was done, how we got there and got back. He, done, he has done that in hopes of rekindling our memory of the most momentous journey humankind has ever taken. <coughs> and it is my hope that the call to what is beyond, the urge to explore the unknown, the willingness to leave the familiar and venture out into the mystery of the cosmos, will be rekindled once again and activated by a new generation of explorers inspired by what happened 50 years ago on this day. Let's welcome Dawson. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you got a seat and a place to park your car. It's hard here at Black Mountain. It gets worse every day, it seems. <laughs> Welcome to the Black Mountain Tyson Public Library. Thanks for joining us for this 50th year anniversary celebration of Apollo 11. There are so many people that have worked hard to make this program happen here today. I want to thank Melissa Presley, our Black Mountain Librarian, for her expert assistance promoting and supporting this activity today. And for today, yes. I have to talk to my little computer at 6 in the morning every day in your library. It's amazing. And for purchasing the new address system that I'm not using, I'm sure you will hear all that I have to say. I also would like to thank library volunteers, Virginia Rainey and B.B. Woodside, for their invitation to help setting up this Apollo celebration. Also, I'd like to thank Black Mountain News for their two excellent articles promoting this celebration. And to thank Trina Rose, our Senior Center Luncheon Program Director, for passing the word along to our luncheon seniors and others. And finally, I would like to thank our operating floor managers, all about you, our several who assembled the, and installed the boards. You see the lighting around it. Don McMahill, Diamond Jim Schneider, Marty Bravo, Richard Wilson, Dave and Alma Bush, my brother Ken, who came all the way from Florida yesterday to take this in with us, and Susan Levy and Catherine Thor, I think is the way you pronounce it, and Virginia Rainey, who has been helping us on a day by basis. And now I would like to introduce my talented wife, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. 
who assisted me in putting this program together. She has a master's degree in chemistry and served as a work perfect information technology manager for Prescar Rose Law Firm in New York City. And now in retirement, is a volunteer teacher for the local Montessori and a Regis Seed program in Asheville. We keep busy as retirees. <laughs> we have been married 63 years. We have five children and four grandchildren. Okay, let's get ready for the excitement. Okay, here they are. Okay, we are all going to fly to the moon this afternoon with Apollo 11. To my right, you see Apollo 11 about to launch. It has its first stage entrance burning. <laughs> Pastor Ross Neil Armstrong, Mike Holmes, and Buzz Aldrin are up here in a command module, ready to go. Okay, there's an escape rocket on the top. There are many atoms below them. Rip them away out of the ocean and hopefully save them. They have never used it. There's a picture of it in test flight. The Apollo 11 will burn one million gallons of fuel in just 12 minutes. Think about it. To get the Earth, to get the astronauts into Earth orbit, 100 miles up, one million gallons of fuel in each flight, just to tell you, okay? Just for one flight, kerosene, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, kerosene, and tetroxide. There are 47 different rockets on each Apollo. Okay, just remember that. We'll come back to that again. Okay, let's see your hands. How many people born before 1950? Boy, do we have a lot of youngsters. I, I, I thought I'd have a bunch of kids in here who were born. Well, those who were born after, okay, hey, the rest of you, Apollo 11 was before your time. But I bet many of you watched the movie, Apollo 13 and the Lunar Module Rescue of Jim Lovell, Jack Swarkin, and Fred Hayes. It was a great movie, very accurate. It captured the excitement of the space program. How many seen C-13? I think it's about everybody. Go back and see it again if you get it. <laughs> I graduated from Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. 64 years ago, with my bachelor's degree in science and physics, and went to work for 10 years for Armour Corporation, building intercontinental ballistic missile systems for the military. In my 40th year, I joined Grumman Aircraft, who had just won the bid from NASA to build the Apollo Lunar Module, pictured on board eight on my left. It's what I call a sports car that takes the men down to the the astronauts down to the surface of the moon. It was exciting times for Berman Aircraft, which eventually grew to 11,000 employees, including their subcontractors. It took 11,000 workers five years and $21.3 billion to build this. We built ATF that came out about a billion dollars a piece, just to give you an idea of the course. Represents about 10% of the course of Apollo is in the lunar module itself. Eighteen. You can just imagine now the lifestyle my wife and I lived. Working for Roman Aircraft. Many hours of old time, traveling to support launches in Houston and Florida, and being call on call 24-7. I don't think many of us have a job that requires you to be, but you have to be if you work for NASA. Now, back a few months ago, when I first met Melissa uh, <coughs> here in Virginia at the library some three months ago, I became very excited about helping the library present this Apollo 11 50th anniversary celebration. I started immediately to research, design, and construct the 12 boards that you see, panels you see around the room. I gathered pictures from my files and online and prepared the easy to read captions so the Apollo program would leap right out at you while you walk me out. I will guarantee that if you spend just a few minutes at each of these boards before you go home today, it will leave an impression you will never 
forget. Incidentally, these Apollo boards will be up in this room during regular hours for another week if you want to bring uh, people, friends who uh, could not make it and your cameras and take selfies, uh, whatever. Now, back in 1961, our then President John F. Kennedy, together with Congress, agreed, agreed to give an open checkbook to NASA to put me on the moon hopefully within 10 years. That means that whatever costs, that's what an open checkbook says. And they spent the money, we'll see that in a little bit. Everyone in this country came together to help NASA do it in eight years. Now you might ask, who was NASA? It was then a very small apartment in our government in charge of matters related to space, known as the National Aeronautic and Space Administration. Now with an open checkbook from Congress, NASA rapidly grew into the biggest technical company ever assembled in the free world. 400,000 workers, professionals. There is no one here that has not heard of NASA. At its peak, NASA hired 20,000 companies like GE, IBM, MIT, RCA, and my, my company, Grumman Corporation. 400,000 professionals. I was just one of those 400,000 NASA employees. But I was always made to feel that my job was the most important on the program. I used to like to surf for back around that time. When we used to meet down the beach 5 a.m. in the morning with my friends and dash back home and get a shower and go to work. Well, one early morning, however, NASA desperately needed me to solve a problem and I was just unreachable. Out surfing on the waves. <laughs> I got to work on time, as usual, but around 11 a.m. I got a phone call from the government president, Joe Gavin's secretary, to report to his office. Joe welcomed me into his office and he said, have a seat, Dawson. <laughs> Seems that you like to go surfboarding before work. I want to remind you that NASA expects everyone to be available 24-7. NASA needed you this morning. Could I suggest that you try to stay a little closer to the job? <laughs> I loved my job. I got the hint. <laughs> At that time, you must remember that we had no cell phones. Can you remember a time when we didn't have cell phones? Okay, we had to keep a pocket full of coins for, for, for the, the corner phone booth. It, it, it was time that a lot of us had party lines and so we're supposed to stay to uh, it's unbelievable. Now let's talk about the configuration of the vehicles. This is a hard thing to, to, to get across to you. The boards do it better, but I'm going to go through it pretty quick, and we'll have time for questions afterwards, and, and, uh, and I'll be here after the talk if you have more. Apollo 11 has two major vehicles that provide living quarters for the astronauts during their flight to and from the moon. The first is the command module. At this item right here, all three astronauts are right in there right now, horizontal, ready to take off. They never get more than 1.5 Gs down the oil. And then 12 minutes, but they go to the moon. It's amazing. I thought it would be much higher than that. Okay? Which was a limousine. I call it a limousine because all three lived in there. They had all their food and whatnot. And when they got to the moon, they left all, all of the lunar module and all kinds of They left their sports car. We are the dirtiest people in the world. Our, this universe has got junk from everywhere. We'll get to that a little bit, okay? <laughs> it's an eight-day round-trip trip to the moon. The command module is the tiny funnel-shaped assembly, which I just talked to you, on the top, to my right. Now, where did I fit in? That's what everybody came for, I think. <laughs> <laughs> When I grew in Grumman, they had already started building the lunar module. Engineers, technicians, draftsmen were being hired by the thousands. <coughs> you remember that open checkbook? It was working. <coughs> Waiting assignment in my first week. They didn't know where to put me yet. I was no runner. I wandered out in the lunar module assembly area to see if I could help in any way. 
I had been a radio amateur since I was 12 years old and was skilled at assembling my own gear at home. I came upon a group of technicians who were trying to solder wires on an assembly board for the lunar module. But none of them had ever had a solder in their hand before. <laughs> I dropped everything and gave a class how to solder. That was my first job as a Roman engineer. <laughs> Looking at the lunar module board eight on my left, just imagine the vehicle configuration. It has a entryway at the top. It was a structure with one door on top, like a jar with a cover. Everything had to be assembled inside the jar, so to speak. Wiring, cable, plumbing, lighting, and of course personnel had to pass through the door also. One day NASA sent a request that we turn the lunar module upside down and shake it. We were a little perplexed and it took us a bit. We managed to rig up an apparatus to turn the lunar module upside down. 47 pounds of garbage to left. <laughs> Tools that Tex had left inside. Paper candy wrappers, fingernail polish, food scraps, you name it. We had to create a whole new system to keep foreign objects out of the vehicles. Establish clean room procedures, throw on white hats, boots, and clothing, log in, log out, take tool inventory. It was an embarrassing moment for Grum at the time. Now the time finally came, finally came, to test the first lunar module in Earth orbit. It would be unmanned and remotely controlled by a newly designed NASA MIT computer. Well, at that time, no one had much confidence in a computer. So Grumman Aircraft decided to build a backup device for the land mission program to do the job should the MIT computer fail while the lunar module was in Earth orbit being tested. Grumman assigned me to the task of designing the building and building this backup land mission program. program. I worked for five years on a backup. They may not have ever used it, but I was told to keep on it and to be a dedicated worker to get it right. As a backup device, the cellular module to NASA should the MIT computer fail. I was invited to Houston when they put that first lunar module into orbit. I cooled my heels outside of mission control, thinking that the MIT computer would do all the testing and whatnot. Okay? I was pretty sure they would not need me, that the MIT computer would do its job. But an hour or so later, Grumman President Joe Gavin first out of mission control to tell me, Hunter, you did it. The MIT computer failed. <laughs> and that Houston control turned on my backup device, which went through the entire test cycle, selling the lunar module to NASA and its first flight in Earth orbit. Everyone was ecstatic, and that was my claim to fame. <laughs> the Grumman lunar module was now ready for astronauts to fly to the moon. So as you can see, that even though I was not an astronaut, I was nevertheless a very important contributor to the program's success. I get cheers every time I see these guys, the astronauts return home to Earth, knowing that my lunar module did it. You have no idea. One quarter of a trillion dollars of natural debt right now is two trillion. To give you an idea. Maybe we want to go back to the moon. What do you think that's going to go? Keep these things all in mind. Just too big a number for most of us to get our hands around. However, we must keep in mind that the Apollo program facilities were subsequently shared with other space programs, such as the Space Shuttle. The program Mercury and Project Gemini, which helped to reduce the cost. They shared facilities, such as the Vehicle Assembly Building, which you'll see in a little bit on the board, the Space Flight Control Centers, the Launch Pads, and the Worldwide Communications Network, 
Keep that in mind. Borderline communication. Without that, we would have had anything. The Apollo program was developed a massive amount of technology, which also is benefiting us today. Water purification equipment, breathing masks, polymer fabric that they use for spacesuits, cordless, custom designed tools that work in a vacuum, scratch resistant lenses, light emitting diodes, and 3D food printing. I don't know what they do with there. <laughs> They also devised freeze drying methods. All their body waste on all these Apollo programs was freeze dried and brought home to, to get disposed of. The urine was recycled and they used it for drinking water. Now, astronauts get most of the public recognition on the Apollo program. Pictures with President Johnson, you remember that was our president at the time we went, standing by the door. Astronauts of this spacecraft and the parades or whatever. But there are two noted civilian participants in the program that should not be forgotten. Werner and Braun, I bet you every one of you have heard the name in one way or the other. He was our rocket engine expert and his team were essential to the Apollo program. Without them, we never would have made it in this kind of time. And as I said before, there's a total of 47 rockets on each Apollo. Without Barnum and Brown, we would probably still be working on getting to the moon today. He was a German-American aerospace and propulsion engineer. He was a leading figure in the development of the rocket technology in Germany during World War II. After the war, the United States managed to entice him and his team to come to our country instead of going to Russia. And Werner von Braun became the first director of the National Mars uh, Space Center, which does all the engine development work. And the other gentleman we should not forget is our flight control director. And you know him because he's the guy that, that you see on TV, radio, and listen, okay? He's a very brilliant person. One who can remember the entire program of the flight and called the no-go-go situations. He's the guy that stands in front of the microphone for the whole world to see on TV and listen to on radio. The one that has the final word in mission decisions. The flight control director, Gene Cranch, who will hear in a minute or two uh, as we fly to the moon, asking for inputs from his enormous staff on results of all the information pouring in by radio. And you'll hear it many, many times. Everything being verified. Number one, go! Number two, go! Number three, go! Number four. You'll hear it many times in the landing. That is the result of all the data being checked and everybody agreeing that everything is working right. Let's go. He doesn't make it all by himself. He has to get it from all his technicians. It's amazing. His decision to go, no go was final. Apollo Dream Pianist was an aerospace engineer and a fighter pilot and was especially highly recommended respected by his astronauts working on the program. Gene Kranz was best known for successfully bringing back the astronauts home safely on the Apollo 13 accident flight. I can remember being at work and I always volunteered to come in. He would ask the question, do you think you could do this? Could we use the Apollo? We don't know. That's not an answer. I don't want to hear that as an answer. Tell me yes or no. And that was the kind of guy he was, and that's how we got them home. Everybody was jumping. The whole company came and worked all night to get those guys back. All right, now I would like to just quickly go around the boards and introduce you to them, because I hope that you know where to uh, take it in. These display boards are designed and built to talk to you with pictures and words. Take a minute or two to look at each board before you leave today. Apollo 11, board one, on my right, is about to launch. It weighs six million pounds. And will achieve Earth orbit in 110 miles up, reaching a velocity of 117,000 miles an hour, all in 12 minutes. A lot of these things we forget about. 
Apollo 11 is 363 feet tall. The next time you go to Asheville, look up to the tallest building, the BB Triaris building. Add in your vision 12 more stories. That's how high the Apollo is. And I've been there the last few days and to look and see, make sure what I'm saying is, and it's very impressive to give you a feel for the size. Now on board two, uh, I'm just going to quickly, without trying to point them out. In board two, Werner Van Braun, our Apollo rocket engine expert, is standing by one of the Apollo 1 engines, uh, Apollo 1 stage 1 engines, to give you an idea how big they were. Each of the five stage engines are 20 feet in diameter. Look at that, there he is right here. Barnum and Bond. That's one of the three engines he's standing by. Give you an idea of the size. Board 3, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. The Apollo 11 is assembled in a vehicle assembly building. That's number three board over there. You read it through it. Speak for itself. Don't get scared. The largest building in the world, the VAB building. 525 feet tall, 40 floors high, covers 80 acres of land, and houses 3,000 employees all down in Kennedy Space Center. It's still there today and still shared by all the upcoming uh, Apollo programs. Once the Apollo 11 is assembled, it has to be moved to the launch site. It's five miles between the launch site and where it is assembled. Once, is that, once the assembly is complete, the crawler transporter was designed to build to, by, by Marion Power and Shuttle Company to move the completely assembled Apollo 11 from the vehicle assembly building. It moved at one mile per hour to five hours to get it from the VA building. You'll see and, and, and uh, gather this information much better here. There are treads on the Corolla, just like our old tractors, the treads. One fleet weighs 2,000 pounds. So I'll give you up. The transporter weighs 6 million pounds, the same weight as the and that's you can't even conceive of this. Board 4 was the safest time in the program. Three of our greatest astronauts lost their life on Apollo 1 test. But the command module went to a fire in the cockpit on the ground. Ed White, Roger Chaffee, Gus Bisson. Roger and I had many conversations. Just read their credentials. It will amaze you. They were our heroes, our space pioneers, a tremendous loss to the program. It took 29 months to redesign and build a new Apollo computer. That picture is from my files. It's 60 years old. It shows where it locates the Apollo 11 lunar module site. And see if you're good with me. Remember Neil Armstrong's words. This is Tranquility Base. The Eagle has landed. Looking at board seven, shows the vehicle configuration of the service module, command module, and lunar module on the way to the moon. You really have to go study that to figure out how they work. This is the best board to see how the Apollo 11 reconfigures its modules on the way to the moon. Board nine. Waldron and Armstrong put their feet on the moon. The reason that we're here today. Erecting the American flag, erecting the TV and the antennas so the rest of the world will witness the event. And collect moon samples to bring home with them. Board 10. The last three Apollos to fly, Board 10, had a new device on board called the Lunar Rover. And you can see it back there, you can see the Lunar Rover. It's an electric vehicle. A battery operated vehicle built by Boeing Corporation to give the astronauts the ability to cover large distances on the moon's surface. It was used to take three, to, three traverses a day for three days. The longest traverse was eight miles. It's been 50 years, so I forgot all the battery. It's amazing when we researched it. And the communication, board 11, 
one of the most important pieces of information. It was a vital that all participants in the Apollo mission could communicate voice and data flawlessly at all times when it went in flight. The Apollo Worldwide Communication Network was established to do this job. It included deep space radio antennas, land cables, undersea cables, fleets of ships, and land bases in 40 countries. Study that board. You can touch it, it's amazing. Communications with the Apollo program at all times was crucial to its success. Over 600 million people, the largest TV audience in the world, were watching the moon landing on their TV sets thanks to this communication network. I do not think any of you missed it. 412, this is finally the fiery re-entry of the command module, the only part of this end time that comes home. That's the only part that comes back to everything else has been lost somewhere. Think about it. Fiery re-entry of the commuter module into where it's over, parachute breaking, splash down in the Pacific. Ticket tape parades, longest in New York ever, city ever had tributes to one of them, Ron and Green Planet in their hometown. 